Welcome to Music History Monday for January 9th, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is An Impresario for the Ages, Rudolf Bing. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the birth on January 9th, 1902, 121 years ago today, of the opera impresario Rudolf Bing in Vienna, Austria. The general manager of the Metropolitan Opera in New York from 1950 to 1972, Bing died in Yonkers, New York, in September 1997 at the age of 95. His was a long life by any standard, but particularly by the standards of an opera impresario, whose professional lives are marked by a degree of life-threatening stress and anxiety that perhaps only has its equal in combat and divorce court. Impresario the term impresario originated in the world of Italian opera in the 1750s, deriving from the Italian word impresa, which is an enterprise or undertaking. An impresario was that single individual who organized, financed, and produced operas, and later concerts. It was a job similar to what a film producer does today, a high-stress job not for the faint of heart or the weak of bladder. Apropos of the impresarios of his day, the great Joachino Rossini, 1792 to 1868, wrote in reference to how he went about composing his opera overtures. Quote, Wait until the evening before the opening night. Nothing primes inspiration more than necessity, whether it's the presence of a copyist waiting for your work, or the prodding of an impresario tearing at his hair. In my time, all the impresarios of Italy were bald at thirty." Unquote. For our information, Rudolf Bing was bald at thirty. Rudolf Bing, 1902 to 1997. Rudolf Franz Josef Bing was born into a well-to-do Jewish family in Vienna 121 years ago today. By his own admission, a terrible student, Bing's parents allowed him to drop out of high school, or gymnasium, at 16. He went to work at the prestigious Viennese bookshop of Gilhofer and Roschberg, before moving on to the shop of a bookseller named Hugo Heller, who also ran a theatrical and concert agency. By the age of 19, Bing was deeply immersed in the running of Heller's concert operation, and he was hooked. Later writing in his memoir, Five Thousand Nights at the Opera, quote, I enjoyed the atmosphere of the theater with its nightly deadline. Only journalism and the theater give you this daily excitement, and it is a poison far more habit-forming than coffee or nicotine." Unquote. For our information, Bing grew up speaking German and English, and as such, was completely fluent in English. His two memoirs, Five Thousand Nights at the Opera of 1972 and A Night at the Opera, of 1981 were both written in English. In 1927, the 25-year-old Rudolf Bing went to work in Berlin and, in time, served as general manager of opera houses in both Darmstadt and Berlin. In 1928, he married a Russian ballerina named Nina Shelominskaya Shlesnaya. They remained married until her death in 1983 and had no children. When the Nazis came to power in January of 1933, it was time to get out of Berlin. The Bings moved to Vienna 
in the spring of 1933 and then in 1934 to the United Kingdom, where they became naturalized British citizens in 1946. It was in the UK that Bing helped to found the Glyndebourne Festival Opera and co-founded and was the first director of the Edinburgh International Festival in Edinburgh, Scotland. In 1949, at the age of 47, Bing was tapped to become the general manager of the Metropolitan Opera in New York City, a position he assumed in 1950 and held for 22 years until 1972. It was Bing who oversaw the Met's move from the old Metropolitan Opera House on Broadway and 39th Street to its new home in Lincoln Center, a 16.3-acre arts complex in Manhattan's Upper West Side. Bing's tenure at the Met was summed up this way by the New York Times music critic James Ostreich, quote, Wielding his powerful position at the Metropolitan Opera with intense personal charisma over two decades, Sir Rudolph Bing ruled much of the operatic universe in autocratic fashion, nurturing young artists and cutting superstars down to size with equal enthusiasm. He oversaw the abandonment in 1966 of the stately but somewhat dilapidated old Metropolitan Opera House, which was then raised, and the construction of a grand monument to his regime, the building the company now occupies, which dominates Lincoln Center. His conservative musical and dramatic bent, preference for Italian opera, and concern for theatrical values yielded an identifiable artistic legacy." Unquote. 5,000 Nights at the Opera Bing's first memoir, 5,000 Nights at the Opera, appeared the year he retired from the Met, 1972. No words need be minced here. It is wonderful. Bing is at turn self-deprecating and egotistical, and the book is filled with theatrical insights and delicious backstage gossip regarding singers and conductors, all informed by Bing's scalpel-sharp wit. Regarding his self-deprecating humor, Bing wrote of himself, quote, Don't be misled. Behind my cold, austere, severe exterior, there beats a heart of stone." Unquote. As for his devastating wit, when he was told that the conductor George Zell, with whom Bing did not get along, was his own worst enemy, Sir Rudolph responded, Not while I'm alive. To the point, no one tells Rudolph Bing's story better than Rudolph Bing. So here's what I'm going to do for the remainder of this post and tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post, which, no surprise, will recommend Bing's 5,000 Nights at the Opera. We will allow Bing to tell his own story, excerpting just enough of the book to wet your whistles. Onwards. Childhood and Apprenticeship. Quote, my family was no more musical than any other well-to-do Viennese families at the turn of the 20th century. We had a box at the opera, and we all went to concerts, and a few times a year there would be chamber music evenings at our house. One of my earliest musical memories is of such an evening, when the Rothschild Quartet came to play a very contemporary work by Egon Velitz. Our chairs were too low for them and they took the volumes of Schubert chamber music that were on the shelf to raise their seats. I thought to myself, I wish they would sit on velets and play Schubert, unquote. Quote, Our family took summer vacations in the Dolomite Alps, not far from where I spend my summers now, and I would walk a great deal in the woods alone. Once, as a very young boy, I remember I met Gustav Mahler thrashing through the woods, singing, looking almost demented. I fled." Unquote. Bing's descriptions 
of how he learned the operatic trade working as a talent agent in Berlin and as an artistic administrator in Darmstadt and Berlin are fascinating and most entertaining. Regarding his job as a talent agent in Berlin, Bing writes, quote, I hated the job with a vengeance. The problem was simply the low level of talent with which the agency had to deal. In Vienna, I had been with a very high-class operation, working with superstars who would not dream of appearing for less than a thousand marks a performance. In Berlin, I would be asked to find sopranos who would be willing to sing Isolde and God knows what else at a fee of 300 marks a month, and I would have to choose among some 80 screaming wretches." Unquote. It was while serving his operatic apprenticeship in the 1920s and 1930s that Bing came to understand and appreciate just how supremely difficult it is to produce an opera. Quote, Although I had been around theaters for some years, I had never realized how much work and foresight, quite apart from talent, must be devoted to any theatrical production. I still marvel at how little the public, including a good number of the critics, understand about the infinite variety of considerations, the millions of decisions that come even before the beginnings of rehearsals. Then there are the sweat and tears of the rehearsals themselves, weeks of them, for individuals and then for small groups together and finally for the entire company. At the end of all, the curtain rises on the first night, the audience comes late, and the critics leave early, and neither really appreciate that they have witnessed the miracle of a birth." Unquote. Welcome to the Big Apple. Bing's famously bad relationship with the New York press began virtually as he sailed into New York Harbor. Quote, we arrived in New York on November 3rd, 1949 and were interviewed before the boat docked. I am supposed to ask you tactless questions, said the ship's reporter from the New York Herald Tribune. Ah, yes, I replied, getting off on the right foot, and I am supposed to give evasive answers, unquote. You know, some of us are lucky enough to do for a living what we were born to do, and without a doubt, Rudolph Bing was one of those lucky people. Quote, the tension under which I worked would, I suppose, be death to those who cannot take it. But it is an inspiration to some of us. The more pressure was on me, the more severe the crisis seemed to be around me, the more calm I felt. It was my task to be the stabilizing influence, and I was." Unquote. Rudolf Bing required every ounce of his legendary cool when he arrived in New York and, for the first time, realized what he had gotten himself into. The Metropolitan Opera Founded in 1883, the Met was, by the time Bing arrived in New York in 1949, the largest so-called classical music venue in the United States in terms of both its budget and number of performances. Unfortunately, what Bing found when he arrived on site was an institutional disaster in the making. Quote, Fortunately, I have always enjoyed tight places and hard decisions that have to be made fast. What I found at the Metropolitan was much worse than I had expected in every way. Physical conditions, artistic integrity, sense of professionalism, and support from the board were all well below anything I had lived with before. Even the financial status of the house was discouraging, especially in the richest city, in the richest country in the world." Unquote. Bing continues, My position for the season 1949-1950 was that of an observer, and most of what I observed was a lesson in how not to organize an opera house. Before I left England, the conductor Sir Thomas Beecham 
told me a story of hailing a taxi in New York during the war when he was working at the Met and asking the driver to take him to the Metropolitan Opera. I'm sorry, sir, said the driver, but we have gas rationing now and the rules are that I'm not allowed to take passengers to a place of entertainment. Sir Thomas settled into his seat and waved his hand imperiously. The Metropolitan Opera, he told the driver, is not a place of entertainment, but a place of penance. I soon learned why Beecham had told me the story. Unquote. Was Bing exaggerating things to make his accomplishments at the Met appear that much grander? No, he was not. Board politics were vicious, and when the chairman of the board, a rich southerner named George Sloan, found out that Bing had a mind of his own, he hit the roof, remembered Bing. Quote, Politically, Sloan was a reactionary to a degree almost impossible to find in Europe. He had all the racial prejudices of the Old South. Even if everything else had gone well, his discovery that I intended to employ blacks at the Metropolitan would have been enough to make him an enemy for life." Unquote. The media circus slash zoo that is the Metropolitan Opera's opening night gala was created by Bing in order to sequester it from the regular subscription series. Quote, opening night in 1949 was depressing in the extreme because of the audience. I had never seen such antics in an opera house. It was explained to me that although the opening night was part of the regular Monday subscription series, Many of those in the audience were people who came to the opera only this once every year. Café society of the lowest order, gossip writers from the gutter press, celebrity seekers and clowns looking for the publicity the newspapers would give any freakish occurrence or appearance at the Metropolitan's opening night. I decided immediately that if I could not prevent such fun and games, I could at least make sure that those who enjoyed them paid the opera for their pleasures. And from the beginning, I removed opening night from the subscription program and sold tickets to it on a separate basis." Unquote. Bing discovered that the grand but old opera house itself was utterly deficient, particularly the lighting grid, the backstage and storage facilities, and the dressing rooms, what that they were, all of which he called, quote, cramped and dirty and poor and decades behind European standards." Unquote. Then there were problems with the crew. Quote, the indiscipline of the stage crews was a hazard to everyone. Some men showed up only when they felt like it. Stagehands could be heard talking while artists were singing, and some of them even smoked backstage, though the place was a tinderbox and could have been condemned as a fire trap by any conscientious building inspector." Unquote. And then there were the productions, the sets, and the costumes themselves. Quote, the productions were mostly scandalous, 30 years old, never substantially refurbished, and low quality to begin with. Unquote. And there were problems as well with the singers. Quote, in an ill-run house, there is, unfortunately, a kind of competition among artists to see who can get away with the most. Once one artist neglects to come to rehearsals, everyone who does come seems to be admitting that he or she is not as important as his colleague. The Metropolitan was the fortunate possessor of the finest Helden tenor, meaning heroic tenor, in the world, Lauritz Melchior, distressingly fat and aging and not quite as good as he had been, but still without rival. But Melchior would not come to rehearsals. His publicly expressed position was that if it was felt he had something to learn from one of the maestri, the conductor in question could make an appointment to meet him at his apartment. The evil effects of this unprofessional conduct by its leading tenor could be felt everywhere in the house." Unquote. 
But the biggest problem Rudolf Bing initially faced was financial. Quote, for an incoming manager, the most startling problem was the absence of a budget. When I asked for this year's budget, I was shown rudimentary accounts for last season. The Metropolitan's business affairs were ad hoc. I had promised my board that I would give them a budget and live within it, expecting that I could work incrementally from existing figures. Instead, I found I would have to make a budget almost from scratch, as though the Metropolitan was something new in the world." Unquote. When we return in tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post, we will see how Bing restored the Met to its rightful place among the world's very greatest opera houses and how he dealt with his singers and conductors. Until then, thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.